they worked very, very hard. And seeing that as a young boy wanted me to you know, work hard on what I wanted to do. And that's, I think that's where it really comes from, the hard work. At the age of just 26, he won one of the most prestigious titles in all of sports by beating Andy Ruiz Jr. from the Faliula village in Samoa, raised in South Auckland. This is Lupe Suliai, La Aoli Ole Maliatoa, Joseph Parker, Indigenous 100. <laughs> Welcome to the Business I feel like. <laughs> that was good. Uh, thank you so much. That was actually good really start. good. That was nice. That was hard. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Really uh, awesome to have you here. Uh, and um, I'm struggling where to start, actually, because there's so much I want to ask you. But <laughs> let's go to 10 December, 10 December 2016. Okay. Andy Ruiz Jr. Yeah. The end of the fight, the decision comes through that you're a new world champion. Mm. What's the first thing that went into your mind? Oh, I, uh, I was a bit in shock. And um, it was actually a great feeling being a champion because of all the hard work and the years that we put into you know, training and, and that was the goal that we had. And then one thing, uh, well, a few things actually, my team, but then mostly because uh, the reason why I got into boxing was my dad, right? And uh, that was the most, that was probably the best feeling seeing him smile and seeing him very happy. Even though I know my coach and family, but that one person was the one that sort of made me think, this is, uh, this is it, this is the best feeling. <clears throat> Your dad's Dempsey? Yeah, my dad's named Dempsey. After Jack Dempsey. Named after Jack Legend, Dempsey, yeah, yeah. This was always your thing when you were young. I think you were three years old and he'd given you your first boxing glove. Yeah, he went, uh, you know, he went away on um, trips to Australia and, and work trips and he always come back with a, you know, a little punching bag, little gloves and, uh, at the age of three, you know, he started getting me into boxing and um, we watched video clips of past fighters and that was pretty much what we did for fun. And so I got, a, got into it at a young age and he introduced me into the sport. It didn't force me to do it. Mm. <clears throat> My mom didn't like it. She thought um, that I should go play golf, be a golfer, you know, or tennis. She took us to all these different uh, yeah. sports to practice and learn, um, but boxing always uh, took my attention. And so at the young age, he got me into it. I had fell in love with the sport. And then uh, when I fought, I fought for our countries, you know, Samoa and New Zealand. But then I fought, you know, for the team and the family, but mostly for, mostly for him. Mm. So when you finally have the belt, yeah, yeah. and you get to see your dad, what was the first thing he said? Uh, you know, my, my dad's a man of few words. He doesn't say much, but I could see in his face the smile and then, you know, gave me a big hug. I really felt, uh, I felt he was very proud. And so I was, uh, at that point of my career, I sort of ticked all the boxes and accomplished everything I wanted to accomplish. And I did it for him. Mm. But now, <clears throat> from since then, I think I'm doing it for myself now. Okay. We'll talk a bit yeah, about that, that, that later on, but I want, I want to go back to that point because Throughout that fight, that, that was a tough fight, I think, <clears> and I know you've talked about that as well, and Andy Ruiz has since come up with some oh, other yeah. things that he said happened in his life that caused that result in the <laughs> way that it was, and he's gone on to, to different things. But throughout that fight, did you feel like, I've got this, I've got this done? I mean, I know it was tough, and I know it was tight, Yeah. but did, did you have it in your heart? You knew, yeah, I, this is mine. <clears throat> I knew after the fight that I, I felt that I won. Listen, he felt that he won as well, but... Um, the, the interesting thing is the lead up to that fight. You know, uh, we were in Vegas training, and then uh, for some reason I had to fly back to New Zealand urgently. <clears throat> and I was here for three days, and then I flew back to camp. And then for the next four weeks of training, I was getting smashed and sparring, and I wasn't feeling the best. And lucky I was speaking to a psychologist at the time who said to me, you know, trust the process, and it took me through all this, even though I wasn't feeling the best in the training camp. So I came back to New Zealand with the mind trust the process but really camp wasn't going good training wasn't good no sleep wasn't the best but I still trusted the process why was it 
not going right. I think uh, fl flying back to New Zealand just for three days and then flying back the jet lag, and then obviously I couldn't um, adapt back to Vegas time fast enough. And so before we left Vegas, I couldn't even complete uh, four to six rounds of sparring. And I was getting punched around by guys I should be doing well against. And so, you know, even though that was at the back of my mind, my, I, I sort of trusted the process. Well, I did. And I, uh, I came confident even though the work wasn't the best work. Despite <clears> my <throat> appearance, I'm, I, I'm not that physically inclined. <clears throat> what do you mean by the process? What is that? The process, uh, my understanding of the process, um, when I spoke to a psychologist, he gave me a lot of things to think about and just uh, things that seemed uh, difficult to understand, he simplified it. And uh, the process is what you're going through. You know, the camp, even though things don't go how you want it to go and things don't go as planned, <clears throat> you always have the belief that everything will be all right. You just gotta, you know, you just gotta keep ticking on and ticking through. And at the end, everything was right. But um, I needed, myself and the team needed to trust what we were doing. So, so let me get this right. You come back to New Zealand from Las Vegas, from the camp, oh, yeah. to, to New Zealand for the fight and the preamble to December 10th. Yeah. And you still haven't done over four to six rounds, is that Yeah, right? I haven't, yeah. I didn't complete six rounds of sparring. So tell me what you do then once you <clears> land in <throat> New Zealand to get to the fight where you go, right, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go. You go right back to New Zealand, everyone asks you, how do you feel? And you, you know, the general answer is, I feel good. Yeah. It was a great camp, whatever. But um, leading up to the fight, we just, the, the most important thing was to, you know, eat clean, sleep well, and try our best to keep sharp and, and sort of training and the training that we did daily. See, I could do that. I mean, I'm not a <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a difference here for <clears throat> someone like yourself. You yeah. can apply that to the situation that you're about to go into against the guy, let's face it, who can bomb. Oh yeah, he can. Right? Yeah. So so what is it in your mind that's saying, get in the ring, face him, this is mine? Which is what I'm trying to get to. Yeah, I? yeah. Uh, I think, uh, no, going into a fight, it's just when you get to that stage of, you know, when you get closer and closer to the fight, you know, you have, well, for the first is the goals that you have, right? And we set goals in the beginning of my career and then after each fight we set goals. And I think trying to tick that goal off is a is the reason why you know I do what I do but also for the people I do it for I get it okay when all the you know build up and you walk out yeah, yeah. you get in the ring national anthems blah, blah, blah. um you know they, they do the final few seconds you're with trainer the bell's about to ring yeah what is the last thing that you say to yourself in your mind mm. before you throw the first punch I don't really, uh, I don't really say much, you know. I uh, in my mind, I'm just thinking, all right, go out there and smash him, and do your job, right? But I look at my parents and no, my, I give my coach a hug, look at my parents, and I'm like, okay, it's time for ready me. Ready to go. I'm ready to go. So let, let's stay with this fight because yeah. um, it's almost a bit of a transition in your life. This fight, right? yeah, yeah. And so that's why I'm so interested in it. So you, you go into that fight, uh, you're going, you're going pretty well. Yeah. Um, and this guy, people are thinking, oh, he hasn't got much to give this guy. Was there a moment in that fight where you felt, oh, gee, you know, got to be careful here? Oh, yeah. I think uh, if I recall, it was the third round. He clipped me right in the ear, right, right in the left ear, and I, and I sort of went deaf. And the sort of bells were ringing, and I was like, oh, okay, damn. And so, but um, <clears throat> when you do get hit in a fight, you never want to show it. Mm. And then he caught me with one good body shot. And I just sort of shook it off and laughed, and but really I was like, oh gosh, <laughs> seriously. So I'm like, uh, but the way that he saw me, I was just, you know, I'm just moving around, but deep down inside, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is sore. So there's a few times in the fight where I thought, you know, this guy is one tough dude, but um, you know, just persistence and followed the game plan. Yeah. And I, I could see, you know, a lot of when the whole, when you have your whole country cheering you on and wanting countries. you, yeah, countries, countries yeah, yeah. cheering you on, wanting you to do the best, you know, you, there's many things that you fight for. Mm. And so the crowd was cheering and I was, you know, pushing through and um, I knew I had to, you know, keep busy in the fight. The other thing is he comes across as a really nice chap. Oh, yeah. he's, he's a really nice guy. There's not many, there's a lot of guys in boxing who pretend to be nice and there's other guys who are really nice and he's one of the nice ones. Wow. Really nice guy. So how hard is that when you go, wow, this guy's such a nice guy, but I'm still going to smash your face. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, um, if you don't smash him and, and uh, 
give him everything you have, he'll smash you. Yeah. So it's like, who, who's going to smash who first? Yeah. So, so you know, the, we've gone through what, what you did post the fight. Yeah. Um, at that stage, does a lot of your thinking go back to dad, three years old, how I started? Oh, yeah. The lessons of when you were a kid. All that oh, kind yeah. Of thing. A yeah. lot of, yeah. When I finished the fight? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of it's just like reflecting on the things I went through and the things our team went through and the things that everyone went through to get me to that stage and, and what I did, you know, working up to that point. Yeah. You know, traveling the world as an amateur all around the world, fighting, uh, in, you know, competitions, living in China, representing China, you know, uh, as an amateur and then traveling in the, uh, Traveling by myself, and then you know all the early mornings, late nights, you know all the the sessions that you go that you go through. When you were a young kid, it wasn't ordinary, was it, for a kid from Hillsborough to be boxing at three years old? Not really. I mean, uh, you know, living in South Auckland, mm. I was living with my parents um, when I was young. It's like everyone, like a lot of people know how to fight. You know, and then uh, sometimes if you don't know how to fight, you get picked on. I don't think, I, I think I got picked on maybe a few times, but. Jesus, <laughs> what's but, your name? Tell us yeah, now. Yeah, no, so. Uh, <laughs> name and change. J- Jerry, uh, no. Nah, <laughs> listen, but, um, yeah, so I, and plus, um, once you once you sort of fall in love with a sport or with something in life, whatever, whatever it may be, then you're just going to, you know, you're going to chase what you want to chase. Yeah. How would your young friends have described you when you were young, at no, that age? No one in school knew I fought until I finished school. Wow. So I didn't tell anyone in school until uh, I think I won a national competition and I was in a the newspaper and then all the teachers were like, hey, you box? Oh, yeah, 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 you know, part-time. But uh, no one really knew and I, um, I played rugby at school, played volleyball, played many sports, but ultimately boxing just, you know, just always drew back to boxing. What, what, why? Is it about that you like so much? The thing I like about boxing is, uh, obviously got introduced, but it's a, it's a sport where it's an individual sport. And it's one of those things where you have to rely on yourself to, you know, to accomplish those goals. You know, it's not really, I mean, there's a lot of people involved, there's coaches, there's families, but ultimately it's you in the ring, you know, the sacrifices you make, the hours and hours you put in, I, I sort of, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but that's that's what I love about the sport. Where do you think that came from? That kind of ultimate accountability, right? That it's on your shoulders, it's yeah. on you once you're <clears> in the ring. Where do you think that comes from? Um, when I look at it, I think it comes from my parents, you know. When I when I was young, they worked many jobs to try and, you know, they came from Samoa and now have a, a good life in New Zealand, but they ultimately they worked very, very hard. And seeing that as a young boy, wanted me to you know work hard on what I wanted to do and that's I think that's where it really comes from the hard work mm. what were they doing when you were young <coughs> uh, my mom worked in many shops she uh sell clothes fruit shop my dad's been at this I think it was Pacific Steel now Fletcher Steel he's been there for close to 30 years now wow. and I worked there um as a young boy I worked there when I was about 15 years old you know cleaning bathrooms and toilets to cleaning the you know the steel mill you know, and, and so it was, a, it was a hard job and um, I didn't want to do that, you know, for the rest of my life. Yeah. What <clears> was it like with your brother and brother and sister? Right? Brother and sister, yeah. We had a, listen, we had, a, we had probably the, one of the, the best upbringings. Like, really? Yeah, we have a loving parents who, who um, treated us all equally and uh, introduced us into many sports. Didn't always uh, support us in what we wanted to do in life. And so up, you know, upbringing is very good. I've got a brother and a sister. My brother's bigger than me, yeah. uh, stronger than me, uh, probably more intelligent and better looking too. <laughs> but um, um, when you've got a brother and a sister, you quickly realise that actually the boys aren't the ones with the mana and the family. Yeah. It's the sister. It's the sister, yeah. Is it the same? Yeah. Yeah? My, uh, my sister, uh, I think my siblings, we, we get along very well. We love yeah. each other. My sister's a lawyer. My brother... You know, he um, still boxes and trains with me every day. So we have a, I think we have a very great relationship. Yeah, yeah. Supportive of, of each other, but also pushing each other to strive to be better. Because your brother's a bit younger than me. My brother's a yeah, younger than me. What did your sister think when you started boxing as well? Was she a bit like your mother? Yeah, she just, she's, she didn't really know. She, she sort of came to the competitions because my dad wanted to come film. And so she's filming it. Go, Joe, go. 
you know, and, and, this, and then I think slowly from there she sort of got into it and, mm. hey, my brother's not too bad. Yeah. 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 But she's never asked me to beat anyone up. You know, she's, she's pretty. <laughs> there wasn't where no, I was going. No, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I just wondered, uh, you know, because, you know, your sister's a little bit older. She's you. a year older. Yeah. yeah. And so I just wondered how interesting that might have been with any potential suitors for your sister, having your dad named Dempsey and you as a boxer and your younger brother as a boxer, then coming around asking for a hand to a date or something or going to the movies must have been an interesting experience for any potential boyfriend she might have. <laughs> She's had one boyfriend and that's the um, husband she has now. Went to the same school and uh, back in school, I was a third form, he was a fourth form um, and there was a seventh form trying to give me a hiding and so he jumped in <laughs> and smashed the guy. But I didn't know he was sort of setting it up so he can, you know what I mean, look good in front of my sister. I don't know. So <laughs> <laughs> he did look good though. He he saved me, but and then uh, since then, yeah, I don't know. Just, oh wow! Uh, I, I wonder because you know you you obviously were still boxing at school, but it sounds like you liked school. Like you like being at school, you like working at school. And, I like school. School yeah. was good. I wish I was a better student, but um, school, you know. You make good friends, you, you sort of uh, have the opportunity to learn many different things. You know, I think I, I sort of, uh, one of my favorites was uh, art. I really love art. Input, anything in particular? <clears throat> uh, I love drawing, you know, I, I think I'm all right. Yeah, let's test it out. <laughs> <laughs> it could be another career after this. But what, you said you were, you no, yeah, were a yeah. bit of student. Yeah, I, was, I think I was a bit naughty. Really? Yeah, I, I think so. How naughty? Um, you know how you try to be the, you know, you and your friends try to be the cool guys and, you know, it's, you're not really the sort of good students to the teachers. And so if I could turn back time, you know, I wish I could uh, be a bit better than what I was. I wow. still passed, you know, yeah. you know which is, um, and I got a scholarship actually after school. Wow. To do construction. Why were you trying to be cool? I don't know, because other people were trying to be cool and you thought it was pretty cool, but then, uh, you know, the older you get, you sort of realise what a silly boy I was, you know. <laughs> yeah. But now, listen, I'm good friends with all the teachers in the school. Well, I keep yeah, in touch with them. Your friends now, I yeah. keep in touch with them and I catch up with them now and then. Yeah. yeah. So when, you, when you're at school and you're training, how hard are you training at the same time as doing school work? What are you doing for a training regime yeah. as you're boxing at school? Uh, I wake up in the morning. My dad will wake, up, wake me up around five. I'll run five kilometres in the morning. Then he'll cook me ten eggs. And you know, there's tuna and this, and then I'll eat, uh, have a good breakfast, porridge, and then uh, go to school. After school, catch the bus and go straight to the gym, and train for an hour and a half, two hours. And so that was pretty much my schedule. Every day. Pretty much every day, yeah. Oh, uh, three times a week, yeah. and then the other days I'll catch a bus and work with my dad at uh, his job. Did you ever think this? Why am I doing this? Did you ever think this is too tough? This is too hard. At some, at, at some stage, there was a there was thoughts in my head. You know, <clears throat> is this going? Is this worth it? You know, am I actually going to achieve something doing this every day? What is a? <clears throat> it's not until I set goals that I actually thought, okay, this is pretty. What were the goals? <clears throat> the Talk to me about those. Um, the goal, the first goal was to, when I started training, was to have an amateur fight. So I. I you know, then in the just one fight, one amateur fight. And I wanted to have a fight and I wanted to win. And, and that was the first goal. The second goal was to be New Zealand champion. And then the, the, the goals after that was to get regional titles, which we did, and then ultimately world champion. world champion. Tell me about your first fight. First fight. I was nervous. I was, uh, I think I was 12 years old. I was um, short. I wasn't in the best. I was pretty chubby. But the guy I fought was shorter and chubbier so he, he made me look like i was in good shape <laughs> and uh i wonder if i walked in there and um it wasn't easy but i you know uh did my thing and i wonder if i and i felt that feeling of you know you're in the middle of the ring you know, the, the breath puts up your hand and you're just like oh man this is you know this is cool what? it's 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 uh hard to describe but it's just the feeling of uh i achieved i did it you know i achieved it do you remember the first punch that you got hit with, and what went through your mind when you got that first hit? Uh, most of the most of the punches you get hit with is not really in the in the fight, but it's inspiring oh. and training and preparing for a fight. You get punched a lot if you don't really protect yourself, oh. or if you don't, you know, duck. 
You did that well, by the way. <laughs> natural. <laughs> it should be natural, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, no, no, I'm good when I'm not in front of a boxer doing it. <laughs> um, so, okay, so you're 12 years old and you're fine. You knew then that that's it. This is me. I, uh, yeah. I sort of, from then I thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Not even, uh, I think, earlier on, not even at the first fight. At a young age, I wanted to be champion of the world. Wow. Uh, what motivated you to do that? Why such a clear goal at that young age of being a world champion? What, what was behind that? Uh, I knew that my dad loved the sport. And then when I developed my own love for the sport, it was, a, it was sort of a, something that I wanted to accomplish and achieve for us both. And my younger brother had the same goal. He wanted to be champion of the world. And from that young age, I just thought, this is what I want to do. And then uh, having the fight at 12 years old sort of cemented that. And then when I started traveling the world at age 15, 16, representing our country, that's, that's, that was it. I'm in. Because you're also inspired by a, <clears throat> another Samoan legend of the sport. Yeah, yeah, um, David Tool. Well, for both countries. Yeah. Right? Talk to me about that. Why were you so inspired by him? You know, a lot of people counted him out. You know, when you look at his record, he beat four world champions and he could have, he should have been champion. But, you know, things happen in boxing that don't really sort of get you to that level or to get you to that stage. But he was, uh, for us, coming out of, you know, representing Samoa in New Zealand, a very small, you know, small countries compared to the world. He did amazing uh, as a professional and on the world stage. And, you know, I remember meeting him for the first time. I was so nervous, I was sweating, and he just made me relax. You know, he just came up to me, hey, you know, I've seen you fight, you know, keep up the good work. And I was oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> my hero is talking to me. And so, and from then we had a good friendship. And, uh, you know, he's, he's still one of the fighters I really look up to nowadays. <clears throat> Even though he's, a, he's a finished, you know, I respect what he's done. Yeah. Do you remember a particular fight of his where you thought, man, that's... I was eight years old when he fought Lennox Lewis and I didn't really understand at the time. <clears throat> All my uncles gathered around the TV, cheering him on, cheering him on, and I was watching and I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. But I didn't really understand, uh, you know, the level that he was at, you know, fighting for the championship of the world with Lennox Lewis. But then uh, from then on, I started watching all his fights. There's one fight that I really like, John Ruiz, mm. where he knocked him out. The 22nd knockout. The 22nd knockout. knockout. <laughs> and it showed uh, how ruthless he was and how determined he was to get to the top. Yeah. And showed, you know, he didn't take any prisoners. Wow. <coughs> when did you know, because David Tua, you know, amazing hands, fast, uh, powerful. Powerful. One of the you know, biggest punches in, the, in history. When did you know you could do that? Uh, at the age of 16, when I went to a competition in Rotorua, and there was no one to fight, so I had to fight a guy who was about five years older than me. <coughs> you're 16. I'm 16. And you're fighting okay. a 21 year Yeah, 21 year old. Oh yeah, that's yeah. an even contest. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Rotorua, eh? And, uh, <laughs> <coughs> Trust Rotorua, eh? <laughs> Rotorua. Now, so I think at that stage, I was 16 and uh, my body wasn't really developed at the time. And then I went over, you know, at the competition, I sort of, you know, who am I fighting, who am I fighting? And I sort of le lean over and look, and I'm like, oh my gosh, what a beast. Oh. And this guy was tank. And then I started talking to my coach, hey, should I fight this guy? You know, is this a fair competition? And, uh, how am I going to do? And then I uh, got into the ring and um, you know, beat him up in the ring. And I thought, wow. You beat him up? Beat him up, yeah. So I thought at that time ago, if I can beat up older guys, you look like him, and uh, and then it sort of gave me confidence from then. I was like, okay. And then ever since then, I fought guys who were older than me all the time. Wow. Did you? <coughs> because I'm trying to get behind your mental process. Yeah. About that, right? Because um, and think, again, not an athlete, right? Yeah. So, so um, you're probably not used to talking to people who are not as athletically gifted. Um, <laughs> not anywhere near your athletic ability, but. Uh, uh, I'm trying to get him behind the process that you go through. Because you're right, you know, you see a guy who's 21 who's so well built and all that kind of stuff. I'm trying to think about, in your mind, what's, what's going on? Listen, in, in the beginning, there's a lot of fear. How are you, like, you know, you start thinking, how are you going to look? How are you going to perform? Are you going to win? You start questioning yourself, did I do enough to train? So in the beginning of my career, there's a lot of questions that I'm asking myself. And there's, uh, there's a lot of fear. So how do you overcome that? You jump, you, you jump in the ring. 
know, you know, you know, you know, know it's not as simple. <coughs> it's not as simple. Yeah. In yeah. the beginning, so in the beginning, there's all these questions, there's fear, and then you have to try and hype yourself up. So you get in the ring, and then you have friends who you know cheer you on. You can do this, you can do this. So you're like, okay, you suck it up, and you go in. But you still have all these questions, and it's, there's a there's a there's doubt. But you go through it. Um, you fast forward that to the professional. You don't, you have no doubt. You go into the ring. I want to smash this guy. I want to win. I'm gonna you know I want to be champion. So there's there's two different sort of mindsets mm. as a young boy, an amateur, as a professional. Yeah. Let's just stick with the amateurs. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah. Because <coughs> does that stay with you for quite a long time? That that doubt, uh, that fear, and having to go through the, you know, okay, I'm just going to get in the yeah. ring. I'm just going to get in the ring. Does that? It stays with you for a while until, because I didn't have guidance in my, you know, I trained at a gym here and I trained with this coach and got advice. My dad went asking guys that beat me, you know, what do you guys do for training? And then he'll tell me. Then I follow their training. Then I beat them. And so, there wasn't really proper guidance as an amateur uh, fighter. And so it's not until you sort of become a, a professional, get all that help, then your mindset starts to change. Yeah. What was it like when you first lost? As an amateur? Yeah. A lot of the competitions I lost were international competitions. Right. I Guys think from US, <coughs> Pacific, I, I said, I, Australia? Know, Serbia, I had to fight in Serbia, I had to fight in Azerbaijan. Well, you're fought. fighting in those I'm countries. fighting Turkey, I'm fighting, yeah, all over the world. How old are you when you're going over there? Uh, 18. Ah, oh, right. 18 years old. What yeah. was that like going to all those countries? You know, because um, there's a perception <coughs> that those countries are, well, they're not New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> they're not, New some, Zealand well, is they're the not most... the most magnanimous hosts, right? So what was that like, just going to those countries? Um, you know, it's uh, the first trip I went to was Azerbaijan. And I won in you know, a competition there, but it was for me traveling around the world. You know, Azerbaijan, then there's India, there's uh, Singapore. We had a competition, so, and then so when you travel the the world and you're experiencing different cultures and different people, it's not until then that you really appreciate where we live. You know, so even nowadays when I travel the world to many different places, I always get excited and happy when I come home. Wow, always. Wow. So you, you go over to these different countries, 18 year old from South Auckland and you're, and you're fighting and you start to experience, I guess the pain of, of losing a, a oh, fight. Yeah. Particularly yeah. when you, uh, you know, are in love with the sport. This is what you want to do, <coughs> you want to be world champion. What's the first thing that happens when a decision is made and it's not your arm that's being raised? What goes through your mind at that stage at that time? At that time? Uh, you're upset. You know, you're sort of like, you know, why didn't I get the win? So why did I lose? Did I, I trained hard and he beat me. So what, what's happening here? You know, you're putting everything in and you're not getting a decision. But was, you know, you ask yourself questions. Do I have the right team? Am I doing the right things? <clears throat> wow. There's never any thought of, oh, it was just a biased decision from a judge. It's this, your, this is you thinking, what can I do to make it better? Is yeah. That, it's not really, you know, my, my mom said to me at a young age, you never, you know, whatever the, the ref does in the ring, when he, if he raises your hand or the other guy's hand, that's the decision. And he's the better man on the day. And you just got to, you know, I, I remember one fight, I was getting a hiding in Auckland, right, at the ABA. This guy came and he smashed me. And my mom said to me, son, I never want to see your nose bleed again. I was, you know, it was blood everywhere. It looked like a horror film. <laughs> and she goes, I never want to see you, you know, get a hiding again. I never want to see your nose bleed again. You're going to either train hard or you go play netball. Or go play netball. <laughs> That's what she said to me. And I, I, I laughed and she goes, no, no, no. You don't understand. This is a dangerous sport. So it's not until then where I just thought, okay, the key is training. You know, the key is training. The key is being in physical good shape, you know, mentally in the right place. Because if you're in good shape and your mind's not right, you're going to lose a fight. Mm. And for all those losses that you experienced at that time, is, is that the calculation that you make, the judgment that you make is, I've done something wrong here, I need to fix that. I haven't got the right team in place. I've, 
you know, got to change that training regime or <coughs> training program, whatever it is. That's immediately what your thought. My, my thought, yeah, my thoughts are I've got to change something because something's not working, something's not adding up. So there's something, there's a, you know, something going wrong. Wow. Uh, the reason why I raise that question is really interesting because there are lots of people, you've probably met a few of them, who think, oh, you know, I was just unlucky because that ref made that decision or, you know, uh, uh, um, um, you know, All Blacks semi-final against England or if Sam Whitelock hadn't pushed the captain, then we would have got a penalty and would have come back, right? You're different. Your thinking process is, is different. And I just wonder if you realise that it is different in the way that you approach that when you've had that experience. Now that you bring it up, I, I, you know, I can see that it's different. But um, it's just there's no... I don't want to blame anyone. I want to take it upon myself to fix things and move on and get better and better and you know, get to the next level. There's no blame and there's no, oh, this happened and that happened. Now, there's a fight, for example, where I had a headbutt uh, against Dillian White yeah, right. and it changed the course of the fight. But things happen in boxing. You know, and even though the ref didn't rule it as a headbutt, you, know, you just got to accept it. You know, that is what happened in the fight. You know, he won the fight. He was a better man on the day. I know I can beat him. That's why I want to rematch. Mm. And if I get in the future, I'll show him that I can beat him. But of course, the headbutt affected me <coughs> a lot, right? I mean, it affected you, me you, a lot. But I'm not going to sit here and, oh, I got a headbutt, feel sorry for me. No. You know, you just got to accept that things happen in boxing or things happen in sport or in life. And it's whether you move on from it or whether you're not going to dwell on it and, and feel sort of down for yourself. And mm. there's no point, I think. It's been said that boxing is political pugilism, that it is a sport, yes, but it is politics and sport. Yeah. <coughs> you would have been aware of this when you went in. You would have been no. aware of this when you... Bec- no? Okay. No. As an amateur, I thought boxing is boxing. You walk in, you beat the guy, the best person fights the best person here. They make a lot of money, blah, blah, blah. That's it. Wow. And then when I started training uh, in Vegas as a professional, and then Kevin Barry's telling me this and sanctioning bodies here and regional bouts and rankings and all this kind of stuff. I just started sort of, I was like sort of like a sponge absorbing all this information that I didn't even know happened in boxing. Wow. But as an <coughs> amateur, you, you never encountered that? You never thought about the politics of, that, were, that was involved in the sport at that time? Because you were in a couple of different divisions, right? You were at heavyweight and I think at super heavyweight for a yes, while yeah. there. Never thought about the politics involved there. No, the only thing I thought of was um, I lost the competition to go to the Olympics, but I beat four or five guys that went to the Olympics. So I thought, if I beat these guys, how come I didn't go? So that's the only sort of thing I encountered as an amateur. But then everything else in the professional sort of game was completely different. different. Okay, before we move into the professional game, though, um, and, and I think this is really quite interesting for me to hear this, because... Um, I guess I'm surprised <coughs> by the fact that that's the only example that you can kind of think of where yeah. politics is involved and anything that happens with you as a boxer in the sport that you, you're, you're following. That's, I think there's a personal sort of... Yeah. Uh, but I, I see that... But I think that says a lot about you as, as an individual as well, not just as a boxer, but okay. kind of who you are and your, your upbringing, that it seems to me that you're a person who is, well, I can change this, I can fix this, if I do this, process wins, yeah. then I get an outcome, right? Yeah. Which is quite fascinating, I, I find. Yeah, it's, uh, like you said, it's upbringing, but also, when I really think about it, it's, it's, not, it's up to you to make a difference, and it's not, you know, things may happen around you, for example, decision here, and win the fight, lose the fight, but it's up to you, it's ultimately up to you to make a difference, mm. and to get to the next level, it's not up to anyone else. Well, and the threat of your mother not being happy about you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the threat of my that mother. That would have freaked me out too, just quietly. Coming mother, home and then she's got a broom. Now. <laughs> I love my mum. She doesn't. She doesn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes now. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, <coughs> so just just one one more part before we get to to the uh, to the professional side of of the sport now and where you are now, because. You know, family's obviously important to you and, and you would have been wanting to have your own family yeah, yeah. in time as well. Did you ever think turning professional might not be the best uh, <coughs> field of endeavour when you when you want to have a family, when you want to you know have kids and that kind of thing? Because it's a long stretch away from home. Yeah. Big things happen with kids, first steps, kids being born. Oh, yeah. be there Missed before. a lot of things. <laughs> But did you think about that before you became professional? No, I was 21 at the time when I turned professional and I, all I wanted to do at the time was fight. 
you know, sign the deal, fight, look after my parents, my family, and enjoy what I'm doing. That's all. I didn't think of a family. I didn't think of I'm going to be. I didn't even know I was going to be training in Vegas when I signed the deal. Who did you mm. talk? Who, who were your confidants? Who were you talking to, consulting with? about the big decisions, particularly this big decision about becoming a professional player. In the beginning, uh, you know, there was Duco Vince, David Higgins, so uh, he, was, uh, he wasn't my promoter at the time. They were looking at signing me. The people I was talking to were my parents, my uncle, uh, you know, my uncle was involved. There was a, a lawyer, Bill Wilson, there was Bob Jones in the beginning. So there were a lot of guys that I was sort of uh, checking in with and making sure that, you know, the contract was right and these things are good and uh, was ready for us to sign. <coughs> you mentioned two names there. They're quite interesting people. Uh, one is um, Bob Jones. Oh, very interesting. Man. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting. Guy. Yeah. How did you How did you get him? I know he's a boxer. And he, he, he loves boxing. Yeah. <clears throat> but how, how did you come into contact with? Huh? I think Duco Events uh, called him and said, "Hey, we're looking at signing this boxer. Can you please help out?" And so we went down and met him, and he sort of became my manager, and he actually really helped me at the beginning of my career. You know, when I was an amateur, he was giving me uh, money weekly to live off, you know, to train, because you know, to pay trainers, to buy food, to do recovery sessions. So he actually he put in uh, some money in the beginning to, to help uh, you know, kickstart me. Wow, okay. And then Mr. Higgins. Mr. Higgins. Another very interesting <coughs> Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I had a very interesting people in my team. <laughs> Talk to me about uh, your first impressions of him when you first meet him. The first time I met David Higgins was when he put on a, a show. I, I forgot where it was, but it was David Tour versus Ahunani or oh, what was yeah, his name. Yeah, yeah. and I, I remember, you know, one of my friends introduced me to David and I shook his hand and he, at the time he had headphones on, he was, had paper running around trying to get the show done, but he stopped and said, hey Joseph, very nice to meet you, look forward to catching up and, you know, when I'm not busy, but he was running around doing the show because yeah. I didn't think he had a team at the time. So that was a, I saw, saw this guy go, oh, first he's got messy hair because it was all, you know, now it's all cleaned up now. But, and then uh, he's, he was very busy. So I thought, oh, this guy's, you know, he works very hard. Yeah. <coughs> and, and then of course he, he works with Dean Lonergan and yeah. then Kevin Barry comes into the picture. Um, and I wonder how you felt when that team was together, how that was, what was that like for you having those very different individuals, yeah, yeah, yeah. very different people involved in effectively your life. Yeah. Uh, I sort of, in the beginning, I just went with the flow. I signed the contract, obviously after the team said it was good to sign, signed the contract and then David and Dean wanted me to train with Kevin. A lot of, you know, my friends and a lot of family and a lot of people in the public said, why am I training with Kevin when he did this to David Tour and this and that. And one of the things that I said was that the only thing I wanted to do was to improve my boxing skill and to get to the, get to the point where I'm fighting on the world stage. And that's, that's pretty much why I, I went to Las Vegas yeah. to train, to improve on my boxing. Did you talk to David about <clears throat> David Tour. I tried, to, I, tried to, I tried to call him and text him and didn't really get a reply. Um, I think when the media broke out that we were going to be doing some training. But uh, recently we... We've been texting and uh, we've been talking. Right. Yeah. You know, you said, oh, just go with the flow. You know? Yeah. Pretty interesting approach to being a professional, <laughs> being a professional boxer. Right? Yeah. Well, as a, like I said, as an amateur, you don't really have guidance, so you don't really know what to expect at being a professional. Yeah. You hear about these guys being promoters, and they're doing a great job with other things, other promotions, other events. So you think, oh, they're pretty good. And then, you know, you go over to Las Vegas and train and you don't know what to expect. So it's not until I actually start getting guidance that I think, okay, is this right for me or is this? How <coughs> did you deal with the people wanting a piece of you, right? Public, you know, because uh, Duco made a, a really big splash about you. Yeah. Uh, and pretty quickly you rise through the ranks and become public property, Yeah. you know? Um, and it's a part of the territory, right? Yeah, it's part of the territory. Yeah, territory become a professional the athlete in New yeah. Zealand. <clears throat> Very small goldfish bowl. Yeah, that's 
from my understanding of this very short conversation you and I had, it's not really uh, your upbringing. It's not really not at all what you're attuned to and accustomed to. So how did you deal with that? First, it was a surprise when someone comes up to you when you don't even experience it in your life before. <clears throat> hey, can I get a photo? Hey, can you sign this for me? And you sort of like, you sort of just say, like, oh, why do you want, why do you want to, you sort of, you know, in the beginning, you're sort of like, oh, you know, okay, like, here's my signature, here's a photo. And then uh, for me, after doing it for a while, it's not about the photo or the signature, it's the appreciation for the support they give you. Because right. if it isn't for the support, and being interested in your career and following you and supporting you and watching you and buying paper you and all that you don't have a fan base and you don't have you know these people are the ones that make me who i am today but how, how do you do that without losing your head you know because people get caught up in the adulation yeah, yeah. and the public support and the signing you know autographs and and doing photos how do you and you're quite a humble guy i've, I've already kind of felt that in the short time but how do you do that without losing you and yeah. who you are and getting caught up in that kind of hysteria and emotion and that kind of... Because, uh, yeah, it's, um, you, know, you see people who get caught up in it and, and change. And there's and many you, examples of that. There's many examples, yeah. And then you see people who it's part of their career and their life, but they, they're the same. I think having the same people around me, I, I, you know, I see my parents every day. I have my same group of friends that I've had, you know, when I was an amateur, you know, I had my siblings around me. And I think keeping those people close to you. And my mom said, you know, I never want to see you change. And I never want to see you become someone who you're not. And um, also the church, you know, the church has um, instilled standards in you young age. And so I think all these things play a big part in keeping me to be the same person that I was before. Yeah. How important <coughs> is the church? Huh? How important is the church? Very important. I go... I go uh, you know, I go every Sunday with my family, and it's uh, you know, the church taught me many things with my parents and with the church taught me how to be a leader and how to uh, respect. You know, all the all the things in life that uh, this just make you a good person. So, how do you align that with the um Infestated lagoon of, of crocodiles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. And yeah. professional boxing. Yeah. How do you align that and that <laughs> to make it like that? That's a good question, actually. Um, How do you keep yourself sane in that, in that circus of professional boxing? You know, when I, I know the church is important for you and family is important for you. What is it that you do to be able to make sure that you keep your North Star, your guiding compass, when you're dealing with all that stuff in professional boxing that just is nuts? Yeah, it's, it gets pretty crazy. Um, a lot of the things I let my team deal with, but I, whatever I do in my boxing career, I have them very close to me, you know, guiding me, helping me, um, you know, looking after me because it is a dangerous sort of, if you get sucked into it, you know, your career can either go this way or that way. And so I think keeping a close team and close knit with us together really helped me overcome all the craziness in the boxing world because it does get crazy, you're right, it's, it's, and it's infested with a lot of sharks. <clears throat> Tell me about some of the craziness. Give me an example of just how crazy it is. You know, you go to press conferences and your opponent, you know, example, this Chisora who was supposed to fight, you know, saying this and saying that, throwing tables, slapping opponents, spitting on people's faces. So he's, there's a craziness, craziness of the opponents. There's craziness of, uh, you know, fights when they're locked in and then, and then just the people, the characters that are involved. You know, there's some characters who are very genuine and want to help you. And there's some characters who are sharks and who are ruthless and who doesn't care about you or your career or your family. And they're the ones you can't get in the ring. Right? Yeah, and they're the ones... Because yeah. the Chisoras, you can get in the ring and then you yeah. can and smash your face, bro. And, that, and that's all good, right? That's yeah. fair. And how do you deal with the ones you can't get in the ring with? You know, how do, how do, what do you do to deal with these guys who have a whole lot of power that you actually can't directly... You can't directly, yeah. You are, I'm, I'm fortunate and blessed that I've picked the right team and the right path to go down. I think if, I've, if I chose a different path and a different team you know, it could change the course of my career. Did it ever get close 
to you saying, I, I need to get out of this. You know, it's just not working. Were there ever times where you thought, particularly post-2016, where you were <coughs> a world champion and, and everything was set up for you, was there ever a time after that where you thought, this is, you know, I can't do this anymore? I've, I've uh, if I'm being truthful, after the, after the Ruiz fight and after I accomplished everything I wanted to do, I, you know, sort of what went, Tyson Fury went through, where he went, not depressed, I mean, he went, he was depressed and he, I didn't go to what, I didn't do what he did, but I sort of felt the same. When you tick all the boxes and you achieve everything in your life, then you sort of, you sort of lose that uh, vision and you sort of lose. So I went through a phase where I accomplished being a champion and then I just didn't really care. Really? Yeah. How long did that last for? Maybe a year. Really? I just didn't care. I go, okay, fight here, fight there, win this, win that. It doesn't really, so my whole mindset just went out the window. Who else knew about that? Not many people. <clears throat> how, how, what? Of those who knew, what were they saying to you? Uh, my, you know, family and friends. Do you really want to box? Or why are you still boxing if you're not really, you know? And then, what do you want to do with your life? And worried that, you know. So this is right up until the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. Yeah. Is that why things go the way they go in the ring for you? Is, is that? A major contributor to uh, so I went through a year where I just didn't really care what I was doing in boxing I achieved this now I just you know muck around and you don't train as hard or you know you don't really focus and then uh, and then I got my drive back doing it for myself set new goals and that's the reason why I went back into 2018 with you know Joshua obviously I lost the fight decision but I really wanted to win that fight and I trained very hard for that and I was focused again. Dylan White I was pretty focused you know I did everything I had to do to train hard and but now it's even I'm going to another level now I want it bad. Yeah. I want to be champion of the world again very bad. Yeah. See it's raining because of the gods. <laughs> this is these are you here. They're saying hey what's up? Saying this all the time right? <laughs> um, um, okay, so uh, just if I can, just you know, I, I don't want to take you to places you don't want to go to, but it, but in that year, um, I'm trying to think about how what's the turning point which which gets the mindset back again. What what do you do that breaks that kind of thinking that you're going through for a year? Yeah, I, it's it's uh, you no, know, the support that I had really helped, but that's not. You know, they didn't really change the thing. The thinking for me was just inside me. It's what I really wanted to do with my life. Whether I wanted to be someone who didn't care about their career and didn't care about boxing and just went with the flow. But I think it was, uh, I found reason again on why I was doing things. I felt like I had, I found purpose and I had it's something I really wanted to do again. How important was your own family, you know, your partner and three, three girls three, yeah. or one girl? One girl at a time, yeah. How important <clears throat> was that in terms of that refocus? Yeah, they, my partner's been, has always been supportive. Uh, I've been with her since we're in school. Mm -hmm. So she's always, she knows me the best out of everyone. And it was very important because without them, I probably would have been more lost and probably been way worse. And, did things that I should have been doing. But having my family kept me grounded and kept me sane and kept me, you know, from not doing things that I shouldn't be doing. You say that you known her since school or you were going out with her? Oh, well, we went out in school and wow. uh, I think for the last 12, 13 years. Wow. <coughs> Long did, time. Did she know that you were a boxer and therefore the potential you know, kind of <laughs> uh, impacts anything that goes with the sport or? No, nah, she didn't really know I did boxing in the beginning and then, uh, I, you know, when we started dating, I told her I did boxing and her dad loves boxing and he's still one of my biggest supporters, you know, wow. my dad and her and, and her dad. Wow. Yeah, I think the boxing did help, you know, hey, can I 
please date your daughter. <laughs> Buy a box. <laughs> you know, it may have helped, but uh, you know, she, uh, she's like I said, she's been very supportive. I said I've missed three births. I've missed all births. I've missed being here for, you know, my sister's wedding, my mom's fiftieth. There's many things I've missed. Wow. And I wish I could have been here for the births and to to support her. But she knows that I was out there uh, fighting for myself and the goals I had, but also to uh, work hard for our family. She sounds amazing. She's, Trust me, if I missed a birth, oh, mate, I would she's, have gone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. She. Uh, What's your name again, sorry? Lainey. Lainey, that's right. Very, okay. very supportive. I, I think you know. I've, I've been, I've been blessed with one of, with the best. Oh. I want to go to the uh, fight um, with uh, Joshua. To lean yeah, on. with Joshua, um, because uh, well, you know, New, New Zealanders were everyone was all, was all behind you. I think we we're all proud of the way you you you, you fought. I mean, this <clears> was a guy that had basically knocked everyone out before, oh, yeah. right? I mean, he's he's a powerful and listen, he's a beast. You, know, oh, yeah. you look at him; he's, well, he looks like one. You know, he's built, <laughs> you know, and he's um, he conducts himself well, and you know, he's a great champion. So good guy, good. Good guy. <laughs> you hesitate. Oh, great guy. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, from the time that I did meet him, you know, he, he was nice. Shook my hand, you know, just the normal hello, goodbye. Okay, but I so don't really know him on a personal level. No, so. But in, in boxing and as uh, the way he conducts himself, nice guy. Simple question then. Why didn't you win? I didn't do enough. Why didn't you do enough? Uh, when I look back, uh, the fight was in March, 2018, 31st of March. I had elbow surgery in December. Um, and for the whole camp, and plus I went into camp at 122 kgs. I was fat, you know, and I had to cut all the way down to 107 kgs. So firstly, I went into camp out of shape. If I was in shape. This, this is this, this year period after the Oh, the year reason. period where I just yeah, didn't yeah. care. So you was, just got out of I that. just got out of that, yeah. Okay. So I was out of shape. I had elbow sur surgery. And so when I was in camp, the, the thing about camp is you go in there to work on your skills and techniques and, you know, you continue to get fit. I was, in, I was in camp trying to lose weight yeah. for the whole nine or ten weeks we had. So firstly, I went in there bad shape. Elbow surgery. I couldn't punch properly until the third week before the fight. But uh, on the day, I felt good. You know, I felt good. I felt like my, my fitness was good, but I just didn't throw enough punches. Maybe I was too hesitant. Maybe I didn't have, uh, you know, I wanted to win, but maybe I didn't want to win as bad as he wanted to win. Okay. Just back up a little bit. Sorry, this isn't chronologically correct, I know, but um, <clears throat> you said that throughout a long period, you, you trusted your team and you had a very tight team yeah. around you. That team changes, right? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Lonergan goes and, and other things happen. <clears throat> Is that also in that, did that also have an impact on you in terms of that period as well, in terms of your fighting and what you were doing? In the time? bad period? Yeah. Where I didn't really want to do yeah. much. Um, with the team. Yeah. There's not so much, to, uh, the team was very supportive of the team the team had a goal of me being champion again and wanted me to win and wanted me to stay focused and stay clean and, you know. Uh, so I think it was just me. I just, you know. So, so no adverse effects of that team changing yeah. on you? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So the Joshua fight happens, right? And, um, you know, you have another couple of fights. And then all of a sudden, the guy that you beat, oh, yeah, yeah. Andy Ruiz, yeah. I and many people's view stuns the world. Yeah, he, yeah. What were you thinking when you saw that round six? I think it was. Yeah, round six. Before the fight, I told everyone this guy's a dangerous fighter, and everyone, everyone was saying Joshua will beat him or knock him out. It's going to be an easy fight. And I think it was only our team, myself, David Higgins, and Kevin, who said Andy Ruiz is a dangerous fighter. And and people sort of laughed. And I, I knew he had the ability to win, but I didn't know he was going to win like that. And I couldn't be, I couldn't have been happier for a, you know, a nice guy in boxing winning. And I, you know, I met his parents, and I think one of the nice things he said after the fight was, you know, "Mom, our lives are going to be better from here on." Or he said something like that. So it was, for me, that was very nice. That was, uh, you know, he, you know, 
caring for his family and, and did it for his family and just a nice guy who won. So I was shocked though when he got when Joshua got dropped and, and sort of stopped. I was just like, whoa, this this wasn't supposed but, to. But you were saying, and, and Kevin Barry was saying, and Higgins was saying before the fight, you all believed he had a glass chin, or you know, oh, yeah. similar, similar words. You all thought if you can get a punch on him, he'd fall like Ruiz got him down, right? I mean, look what happened with um, uh, in his fight the, before that with the Klitschko fight, right? Where he got he got dropped and got then dropped, he came yeah. back. So you always believe that, right? Was it just because of the fact that he did it so easily in the third round and then again in the sixth round? Yeah, Andy? Yeah, yeah, with Andy, yeah. The, the reason why we say glass jaw, jaw and all that, it's not really, we don't really, it's not really what we think, but we're trying to lock the fight in. No. And we're trying to get attention. And if it wasn't for getting the attention, they wouldn't have given us the opportunity to unify the belts. Oh, so you didn't, you didn't, you didn't actually I, Listen, I, respect, I respected him and I, I knew that he was a good fighter, but we had to come up with a plan on how to lock in the fight. Right. And then the glass jaw came into play. We said this and said this. Then they started, you know, we, firstly we called them and said, can we unify the belts? Mm. I think they thought, oh, you have no profile in the UK, so what's the point of bringing you guys in and wanting to fight someone else? It's not until we got attention then they said they started, they started negotiating with us and saying, okay, this, we can make this happen. Okay. So sometimes it's a, you know, you do things in boxing which you don't really want to do, but you have to do it to. So, so how, do you, how do you reconcile that, Joseph? I mean, how, how do you reconcile that this isn't your natural? Yeah, it isn't my natural thing. And my, listen, my mom doesn't really like it. No, she, seriously, she's like, one time I said to my opponent, I'm going to knock you out, which is what I wanted to do to him. And my mom said, why are you saying that? <laughs> I said, because I want to do it. And she goes, but that's, you don't, you know, you just go out there and do it. Let yeah. your fist do the talking. So there's some things in boxing where now <clears throat> at this stage, I would never be uh, influenced or told what to do. Whereas in the past, you know, some things they'll suggest and I, you know, I'll, I'll do and I'll say, do you try? Well, well, why do you say that? Why do you say now I'm not going to do what I don't want to do? What, what oh, no, it's been for a while now. I don't, I haven't done, hmm. you know, I, but I want to be me. I want to be real. I don't want to be someone who is forced to say something that I don't want to say. And then, you know, and it's not really me. It's not authentic. You know, Joshua picked up on it when I, when I, uh, when I said to him, I, you know, you fight me and, you know, I'll smash you, blah, blah. He goes, he, he saw the interview and he said, no, I didn't really feel it because it wasn't really him. Mm. So I just want to be me now. I don't want to be anyone that I'm not. How hard is that going to be, though? given the infested shark waters that you inhabit now, being a professional boxer, how hard is that to do? To be yourself? It's a little hard. Sometimes, like, you're forced to be something that you're not, and you're forced to say this and do this and do that. But if I be true to myself, I want to just be me. Okay. It is a little difficult, but... So, let's go back then to, to Ruiz, sixth round against um, Joshua, knocks him out. Do you think cha-ching? <laughs> <laughs> or do, do you, you know, seriously, yeah, yeah. I'm being serious here. What because you're, you're a boxer, you've got to... I was standing there going, <laughs> holy. You know, and then I sort of looked over at uh, Eddie Hearn and the whole stadium was in shock. And I'm sure the whole world was in shock. Mm. And I thought, oh, it's on. I beat this guy. So <laughs> maybe, maybe he wants to rematch in the future, you know? So. Yeah, yeah. But he's, uh, like I said, I'm happy for him and you know, what he's achieved, because there was a time where he was going to stop boxing and give up as well. So, have you, oh, this is probably going way, way too deep into it, but it seems natural to me that that should be the next fight, right? Now, I know he's got a rematch course. Right? And he's, he said in an interview, he said he wants a rematch with me, and I hope he does, because, uh, you know, he said that he trained himself for that fight against me, and I didn't have the best camp, and so if we fight again, that'll be, that'll be a great fight. Okay. And that's the one you want, or is it? Or actually, do you want to have a go at someone else? Or? I don't care who I fight. <laughs> no, seriously, I'll fight anyone. And I've said that to my promoter. I'll, I'll fight anyone. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think we've done an hour or so, but I, I just want to keep going because there's a couple of things aside from boxing. Right? I want to yeah. talk about you, family, and and what you want to do going forward. Yeah, yeah. You can't be a boxer for no, no, you can't. But if you you know the uh, um, hazards boxing. involved in boxing. Right? I'm done boxing at the age of thirty-one. Really? Yeah. 30, no matter what? No matter what. My goal is to be champion of the world again. Um, but if I'm not champion of the world at 31, 
I'm out. The only reason why I'll carry on a little bit is if I'm dominating and winning and then stop around 32, but 31 is my age where I'm like, that's it. What, why 31? Is it arbitrary or is there something in you that's, you, you know, is that because of the plan or why 31? Yeah, uh, 31 is the age where I think that's where actually heavyweights are in their prime. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, but I've been involved in boxing for a long time. I've achieved a lot of things I wanted to achieve. There's a few more things I want to achieve, be champion again. But I just think, you know, there's a lot of boxers that go into their fight, right? And then they, they, they don't know when to retire. Or when they do retire, they do comeback fights. I want to be, you know, a good example is Lennox Lewis. He became champion of the world. He was offered a lot of money to come back and fight Vitaly Klitschko, but he stayed retired and he never came back. And for me, he knew when to stop. He knew when to give up. He set himself up for life. And that's, for me, that's a great example of a, of a fighter who not only did well in the ring, but has done well in his life to look after himself and, you know, brain cells and all. <clears throat> Does that worry you? Are you are you worried by the potential damage that might have already been caused as a result? Is it? It's, uh, I'm not worried, but I, I said to my team, you know, I'm stopping at 31, but also if you see me take too many punches in, in fights before I'm 31, please advise me to stop if you feel like. Or I, I think... I can sort of make the decision my own myself. If I feel like I've taken too many, or if I feel like I'm not feeling the best, then I'd rather have my health than to carry on fighting. So 31 comes around, right? 31, 32. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's say 32. Okay, just <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, just right, in case 32. Andy's going, I'll wait out till he's uh, 32. <laughs> um, so th let's say 32. Then what? Then what do you do? Uh, I wanted to build a gym. I wanted to build a gym in South Auckland somewhere to help, um, you know, young athletes who want to... The, the thing with us is that we, we got a lot of talent in New Zealand and another side of the world, but we just don't get them on the world stage enough, I think. Like we have the Commonwealth, we have the Olympics, but I think we need uh, more guidance within you know, the youth and how they, they do things and how they operate. And also, yeah, I just want to promote young talent from the outside of the country onto the world stage. You told me you thought you were a talented artist earlier. Yeah, well, maybe I could do art. <laughs> I, uh, I love playing the piano. Guitar. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. I love the triangle. <laughs> Shakers. <laughs> no, I love the piano and guitar. Wow. Yeah. And what about, you know, uh, well, wonder, you are yeah. a South Auckland boy, right? South Auckland. <clears throat> but, um... You've got a, a deep connection to Samoa yeah. and to the people of Samoa. Uh, uh, have you ever thought of, after 31, 32, maybe moving back to the island? Uh, I want to move back to live. I'll, I'll go there. I, I go there every year. I go there twice a year. You know, to visit family, friends, got good sponsors there, help out in the community. Um, but I also want to, you know, I want to do something there in the future, um, you know, to help <clears throat> whether it's uh, sponsoring academic or sports, you know, I want to help out. At the moment, we've got a Team Parker initiative where, you know, for every piece of merchandise that someone buys, we donate a, a piece of sporting equipment. And uh, we're starting off in Samoa, then we want to move to Tonga, we want to move around to different islands. Okay. I, um, look, I, I think you're an awesome guy. I, th I think you're, you're very humble. You're quite inspirational in the way that you can just engage with people, whether they be South Aucklanders or, oh. or Kiwis who just want to autograph or the sharks that infest <laughs> kind of uh, lakes in the, in, in the professional boxing circuit. And I, I do really wish you all the best, no matter who you fight. Yeah. Um, but the, the most important thing, I think, is, is that I, you should know that you've already kind of inspired a generation, I think, of New Zealanders by being a world champion. And um, no matter what happens... No one's ever going to be able to take that away from you, right? Yeah. No one's ever going to be able to. And I wonder, have you thought about that? You know? Have you Not really. I know there's a lot of kids that look up to me and, and I try and be a good example, but, but I don't really understand the influence that I've had yet. I haven't really, uh, maybe I haven't come to terms with it yet, the influence. But I get, you know, messages, you know, thank you for inspiring us and, you know, and I just go into my, Instagram with random messages. Okay, thanks for the support. And say <laughs> hi to everyone. So it's, uh, maybe I haven't come to come to grips with it yet, but maybe in the future I'll understand it more. Thank you very much for talking to us.
uh, on Indigenous 100. Um, there will be New Zealanders, uh, people from Samoa, uh, across the Indigenous community, uh, who I think will be fascinated by what they've heard from you in the last hour and a bit. From us both, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very little from me. Um, but thank you very much for your time. And as I say, I wish you all the best. And God bless you. Thank you.